Good evening and welcome once again to DAG uh, and to our platform where these conversations uh, take us in different directions and help us look at and understand art, help us look at and understand artists, their journeys, but also bring in perspectives uh, from outside, from other disciplines, etc., uh, which helps us enhance the way we look at uh, art per se and try and understand uh, the multi-dimensional uh, elements that go into art practices for various artists. Uh, before we start uh, today, I am going to just in memory of Gogi, an unlit cigarette is what I'm putting over here so that we are reminded of her presence with us. Uh, Gogi was nothing without her chai and her cigarettes and her great sense of joie de vivre and the way she would reach out to people, touch their hearts, uh, connect constantly with people. Anyone that she came in touch with, uh, she was a person who uh, kept those relationships alive with her regular phone calls, which are reaching out, uh, with wanting to share the work that she had done, to share stories, uh, and sometimes uh, also to uh, ask, I, I can't really say favors, because she was always helping people, connecting people, whether it was students, young uh, artists themselves, etc. So the network of relationships that she built up, she would try very often to uh, help these people uh, by trying to organize either internships or get them information, materials, uh, give them access. Uh, sometimes at DAG, uh, they would come in looking for information through our archives, uh, through our inventory, etc. And we were always uh, very gladdened to do that. Uh, always a very, very special artist. Uh, we first did a retrospective uh, with Gogi's works uh, all the way back in 2011. Uh, this is her second retrospective at DAG. Uh, and that is very, very special because we've only ever done uh, two artists' retrospectives. Uh, Rubina, you know that, uh, Robin Wandel and uh, uh, Gogi Sarojpal. Uh, so it feels that much more special uh, for us. Uh, I'm going to kickstart this evening's discussion before we go into the subject that we're going to be talking about by asking you both what or who Gogi was, what made her so special, what your memories of her are, uh, and how we will remember her more as a person, less as an artist, because that, of course, we will get into. So I think let's explore the person that she was. And would you like to start off on that, Urvashi? Actually, why doesn't Rubina start? Okay, right. it's up to you. Okay. Thank you, Kishore. I think uh, in one word, if I have to sum up Gogi, I would say Gogi the fearless. <laughs> she was absolutely fearless. And uh, I came to know about her courage and about her life gradually. This was also the time when I was working at DAG and on the Gogi Sarojpat project. And it was during that time that Ashish acquired uh, Gogi's works. So I very often met her, and that became a friendship and a regular routine where G is sitting here, and he would be knowing how many, many times I uh, used to visit Gogi. And the more I came to know about her, I realized that throughout her life and her art making, she was someone who worked absolutely with the idea of being free. Mm -hmm. and be ruled by no one and by no rules and no conventions. Mm -hmm. So I would, uh, I would, yes, I remember the cigarette. <laughs> and I remember it more so because she reminded me of my grandmother. My nani used to smoke. And she also used to have two plates, you know, two, two chotis. And very simple, like she was absolutely simple looking from, again, from North India and spoke also in her way. And she really looked so similar to me. And whenever I, whenever I was there, she reminded me so much of my grandmother, who I looked up to because she was also the one who was fearless, fought court cases against men for land, for property, for 
communal riots when the houses were burned, all of those memories, you know, and in a way I was connecting many of the stories that Gogi told about partition and thereon uh, with, uh, with the way that she had uh, her formative years, you know, uh, were shaped by those memories. Yeah. Nani was her yes, role model as well. was a role model and, a, and an absolutely an amazing woman. So I think Urvashi has written about it. She can also add in here. Yeah. Yeah, Kishore, my um, friendship with Gogi was very brief and very intense. In some ways, I feel a bit of an imposter <laughs> because I knew her work, but not well. Because I'm not an art critic. I don't. I'm just somebody who looks at art and says, I love this and I don't like that. Um, and then you, Dag, asked me to do this piece on her, which is why I went to see her. And from that moment developed a very anoki kind of friendship, you know. Um, I mean, she immediately started addressing me as Tum, uh, which I loved, and spoke to me in Punjabi and a little bit in Hindi. But um, you, uh, Rubina, saying that she reminded you of your grandmother. So Gogi and I were like almost the same age. She was eight years older than me, I think. Uh, so there was no grandmotherly thing over there. It was just a friendship of, of two women who are more or less the same generation. But um, what struck me, there were many things. Gogi was a very visual person. So my first impression of her in that room in which I met her, the front room of her house, Ambi and Ved sir are here. They um, will Ambi, aap nahi the na? I think Mickey was there the first time I. Ha yeah. ha, Mickey was there. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there was a. She came into that room, and that entire room lit up. And it lit up with her eyes, and it lit up with the bits and pieces of red she was wearing. Something. And then there was the, the cigarette and the ashtray, which is a very particular kind of brass ashtray, which is covered with a net. And the net you can rest the cigarette on. And I remember this from our homes in the Punjab 50 years ago. Uh, these kind of ashtrays used to be hanging around. And then, of course, as Rubina said, she was extremely individual, very um, full of humor and full of odd contradictions, odd, very odd contradictions. She loved Nitin Gadkari. I could never figure out why. And she used to, you know, she used to keep telling me, Nitin Gadkari ne itni sari sadkein banayi hai, ye sadkein to bhoot achche hai, wo bhoot achcha aadmi hai. Um, and he has to get some post. And she thought she was convinced that he would you know, do well in the elections. And I was telling her, Gogi par unko to nikal diya gaya hai. Matlab, he's now in the side. And she said, nahi, nahi, wo aayenge aap. You know, you don't worry about that. I wasn't worried, but, uh, <laughs> but. Mm. And then she had this, who would have thought this amazing artist was all this inside her, you know? All this that she's thinking, it's churning in her mind with the history she's inherited from Yashpal, mm. from Dharampal, from Durga Bhabi. So, um, the one of our initial bondings was because Durga Bhabi, the wife of Bhagwati Charan Bora, who was an associate of Yashpal, who died while making, trying out the bombs that uh, were being collected for Bhagat Singh and uh, Dutt to use to throw in parliament. Durga Bhabi was somebody I knew well. And for years I had extensively interviewed her. So we bonded over that, although she wanted to say she was the better Durga uh, of the two. Uh, so, you know, someone so individual, and then she listened to Man Ki Baat. She listened to Man Ki Baat with great devotion. Aapko yaad, Mickey had, you know, set it up on her computer. She wrote letters to Narendra Modi, and she had them all on her computer, and she read them out to me. And those letters were about, in the time of COVID, they were about COVID. They were about getting wheelchairs for people up in Himachal. They were about, you know, organizing... Uh, medicines and oxygen and all of these things she she helped with. So, um, in a sense, I did not get to know her as the artist Gogi. We never talked about the art. We talked about Gogi, the person, and Gogi's life, um, and the things that she thought 
connected in her life with mine, which were the Punjabi Pahari connection, which were the partition, which was the history of women and her general feelings towards them, and which was, I have to say, single malt whiskey, you know, <laughs> drunk with, I'm afraid, tonic water, which was very bad, but uh, single malt whiskey, she had a love of it. She would always say, Daru pienge, Indri pienge, pehli baar laproig nikali, uske baad Indri nikali. So, I mean, it, for me, it was just this wonderful, intense friendship, and it went before before I even knew it. I don't even think, I don't know kitne mahine honge, che mahine honge shayad, that I knew her, not more than that. And then it, it was just gone. But I was so fortunate that I met her four days before she passed. And you know how it is with friends when you're wanting to see them, but you've also got lots of things to do. And so I kept thinking, I'll go or not go. Rene Dityun, I'll go next week, etc. But she was very insistent. And so I went. And I was really, really grateful that I got that time with her. And Ambi shot a little video of the two of us drinking Indri, which I still have, which is a really precious memory. So she sent it to me afterwards. We could have screened that. We could have screened that, yeah. It's literally like about eight minute ki video hai. Okay. Uh, to very quickly put in perspective uh, Gogi, her art practice and her career. Uh, Gogi was born in 1945 in Uttar Pradesh to a Himachali family, uh, came from a family of freedom fighters. She studied uh, art first briefly at uh, Banastali Vidya Peet, which is outside Jaipur, and then of course went on to complete her uh, diploma in painting in Lucknow before doing a post-graduation at the College of Art in uh, Delhi. She also taught art in Delhi uh, at the Women's Polytechnic, at the College of Art, and at Jamia Millia itself. Uh, her early work was canvases, and her early work looks at marginal marginalization and othering more in terms of experiences through her own life, whether it was other, uh, uh, you know, non-human creatures, animals, uh, or young monks that she saw uh, being kind of uh, sent off into monasteries. And this kind of uh, thing troubled her enormously. The whole idea that children could be removed from the shelter of their families without their permission in any way being sought. That idea of uh, being othered uh, and that is something that grew into her art practice uh, and became stronger and stronger. And the voice, which was humanitarian, also became more tightly focused in terms of concerns around women and women's lives. Uh, from the 90s onwards, we see more of, her, uh, more of the work that we are familiar with. Uh, the the uh, Kamdhenus and Kinneries, the works on paper, the borders with their, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know the paintings with their borders borrowed from uh, Pahari uh, miniature paintings, etc. So the iconography changes from that time onwards, and that's really the mo uh, Gogi that we were more familiar with, and I think that's the uh, Gogi we will be uh, talking a little about. We will look at issues of uh, gender, uh, of her practice, whether it was strictly feminist in the way we understand feminism, or whether there were elements of it that she took and absorbed, and then looked at purely from her own uh, point of view and her own context and her own life, etc. So I'm just going to read out a couple of passages that I think are very, very interesting, uh, and uh, take it from there. So. Uh, Urvashi, in her essay uh, in the book, uh, Mythic Feminities, uh, writes about uh, this particular aspect of Gogi's work. Uh, and I quote now, she has said often enough that she did not like any isms and would not choose to describe herself as a feminist. And she was quite vociferous about it. So I don't go there. But when did her women start to take over her painting? When did the half bird, the half animal with alta reddened feet, the hathyogini, the kamdhenu, the woman with the secretive smile, the one with a hint of sadness, a third with the memory of loss, uh, the kali with the sickle in her hand, the artist's own persona in her renderings of herself? When did all these women arrive and demand to be painted? And what was the knowledge, the hauntings, the sadness, the interiority they brought with them? Now, the question I'm going to ask you, Rubina, uh, tell us about the myth-making 
that emerges because she asks a very relevant question. This woman who is now converted through this kind of hybrid uh, creatures that she starts creating, the Kinneries, the Kamdhenus, etc. Where does she come from? And what does she communicate through all of this in her practice? Well, that's a right question, but I'll, I'll, I'll quote Gogi here because when I started talking to her about her work, she said that we women at some point of time were placed in a precarious position, you know. We were working, trying to work within a very male-dominated art scene, also a kind of a patriarchal structure that, that really uh, kept us away, in some way marginalized. And on the other hand, we had heard about the Western model of feminism, which was also something that gave us, did not, was discomforting for many of them, okay? So here we were, and we were trying to do something that we thought was relevant in our art, in our life. And I think what she meant, what she said was that when I started painting, and she quoted very openly about this, and she was at Gadi and earlier, she was always looked down upon by her male contemporaries who said that don't do this. This is a dangerous place you're getting on. Don't paint women, and especially not nude women. Okay, mm -hmm. and it uh, for her, anyone saying don't do this <laughs> means oh, that do this. Back. It yeah. has to be, you know, it has to be confronted, it has to be examined, it has to be understood, it has to be questioned, and it has to be resisted. Okay, and uh, she she said it almost felt like what Berger said, you know, that uh, men act and women appear, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. or or in a way that men ha have the prerogative to paint women paint them nude, but women cannot paint themselves in nude, or women cannot paint women. And that's where this, the journey begins in terms of cent, you know, centering on the idea of women, women's lives, you know, work that women do. Also, the protagonists come from uh, everyday life, you know. And this, I, I can say of all the artists at that time, Nalini Malani, who lived in a chawl, was looking at uh, you know, lab women laborers, you know, similarly, uh, Pita Singh was doing something like that. Uh, here is Gogi, who's trying to actually uh, paint women, not just the models that she worked with, but also women who she interacted with and who she engaged with, okay, and who, with whom, and her own experiences as well, her personal experiences as well. This is how it starts for her, you know, and often when you see these early uh, paintings of all these artists, you, you see women in confined spaces. These confined spaces can be domestic spaces, uh, space indoor spaces. Sometimes there are so many women in that crammed in that space, but they're not looking at each other, but they're just together. We, would, we can trace this back to even Amrita Shergil, for that instance, you know, where you have women in a room, many of them, and they're all there, just quiet. And I think, uh, it was about expressing forms of isolation, sometimes humiliation, you know, sometimes uh, confrontation. All those things, you know, were adding up into the work, and that's where she started working and thinking about where to go for imagery, I think. She, she talked a lot about traditional imagery because she was very familiar with miniatures. She, she had seen so much of Western art that she could quote many of those women artists, as well as male artists, whom she had seen, and she could talk at length about them. And then where would she lead her, <laughs> you know, uh, her painting was important for her. Also, she, in her very early, con my earlier conversations with her, she said, I soon understood uh, easel painting was the way we began, you know, when, when we were taught in colleges, the academic painting, it was a very male dominated field. And first thing was to teach them, teach about easel painting. And as you said, that she started with that, but soon she was, she lost interest. She said, I was very drawn to the idea of working on paper, working on gouache, working on modest size uh, drawings, modest size paintings, which was not happening because then, in then the, the 
painting then was dominated by the grand narrative of nationalism, historical pride, <laughs> glory, you know, many of those things, you know, mythologies also. And she was trying to look at how women would, are looking at intimacy, spaces of intimacy, domesticity, everyday life, encounters, things like that, personal encounters and personal experiences. Also and sexual, yes, and sexual desire, of course, that comes with Kamudenu. I remember she talked at length to me about Kamudenu and says, "Tu jani pata, jab bhi hamare ghar mein koi aata hai, to kaise? Aye, bhai, ye beti meri bilkul gai hai, gai. And you know what that means, you know? Gai ka matlab hai, wo jo chup chup sar niche rakhe, sabki baat sune aur sabki baat maane, okay? Us gai ki koi khwaish nahi hai. And she would start and then talk about this Kamudenu in in. In, in so many anecdotes and stories that would come through her in a very compelling way, you know. So it all started like that, you know. So coming to hybrid imagery and composite imagery, she says, it's always been part of our culture. It's always been in my memory. So it's nothing new that I'm addressing. I'm just trying to reinvent my own <laughs> imagery through this, you know, examining both mythologies, histories, literature, and any and every source of references that came through her. Uh, very, very true. Yeah. I think when she talks about the Kamdhenu, when she started the Kamdhenu series, I mean, it was in the 90s, and the 90s was also when she was doing the uh, Nika series. Uh, and then she goes on to do the Shingar series, and then she comes into the Kinnari series, etc. So she is looking at women. She is looking at beauty. Uh, there is a very strong sense that she has of creating an aesthetic <laughs> Uh, which goes uh, against the very uh, notion of feminism as it was understood at a certain period in time. Uh, so she breaks that and creates her own uh, void or creates her own little world uh, somewhere. Uh, and she also talked, uh, I mean, you explained the whole context of Kamdhenu, etc. But she also talked, and uh, I mean, I inherited that Gogi project from you uh, at the age and took it forward. Uh, so at that time, again, in these uh, meetings that we would have, she would go on at great length to talk about the role of women, mm -hmm. saying the whole idea of feminism is a Western construct, it's a political construct. For us in India, we have to understand that as women, we are the nurturers, that we are the people who will always be a daughter. We will be a mother, we will be a daughter, we will be a sister, we will be a wife. Mm -hmm. These roles may shackle us to a certain social construct that is required of us as nurturers, but we are still liberated enough mentally and we need to be able to escape within ourselves to go to the space that we choose. And I think that is the space that she was creating with her kinnari especially, but also with the Kamdenus and all. That's how she defined femininity. Yeah, and the whole idea of femininity, alta, yeah, absolutely. That whole idea of desire. Yeah, this is yeah, she yeah, she absolutely. So, uh, and now I'm going to quote from your essay, uh, Rubina. Sure, before you do that, can uh, I come in on Yeah, yeah, of course, of course, of course. I mean, uh, this is where I was leading, but of oh, course. Okay, no, then go ahead. Okay, yeah, you. okay, all right. Uh, I mean, I'm quoting from uh, uh, Rubina's essay now. Uh, while she was clear about addressing the marginality and subordination of women, she was far from accepting a given ready-made notion of feminism from the West. Uh, feminism for her could not be a theory or textual treatise transferred onto one's circumstances and cultural reality. If anything, Gogi's is a living and evolving feminism, uh, was. Uh, extracted from personal anecdotes, ancestral stories, grandmother's tales, myths, cultural readings, and narratives from everyday life. Uh, her sustained acts of resistance and resurrection have shaped her identity as a self-empowered woman artist, living and making art on her own terms. Uh, in her words, to be liberated, a woman must first feel free to be herself. So that is where, uh, you know, uh, I would ask you, in your meetings with her over the six-month period that you came to know her and you were writing about her, uh, from what you knew her as a person, 
uh, and the art that you have seen, whether earlier, and of course as a result of this uh, exhibition. Uh, where do you see her as either a feminist or not a feminist, as someone who proscribed to feminism or did not, or created a, uh, a, a context where she said, yes, there has to be feminism, but within the uh, coordinates that we are governed by. Where would you place her? What, how would you read her? i sure I wouldn't. Um, to me, a label is what you make of it. You want to own it, you own it. You don't want to own it for whatever reasons, you don't own it. I would call myself a feminist because it's what I live and breathe. It is my identity, it is my very being, and I find that label enabling and really important. But Gogi didn't, and that's fine, because she had good reasons for not wanting to own that label. But in every act in her life, in everything that she did, in what she painted, in the way she interacted with people, in the choices she made, in the way she dressed, um, Everything, I think she did all the things that we would call as feminist, but let's not deny that the concept carries with it this stereotypical notion of being a Western construct, and therefore people react, react. to it. I think actually, if had Gogi lived, this is one of the discussions I would have wanted to have with her over and over again, about who is and what is a feminist, and how do you actually define that person? And what is it that's different in you which is not that person? Because if you look at feminism as a cage in which there are certain rules according to which it binds you and you have to behave according to those, mm. that's a load of rubbish. It's not like that, mm. right? The starting point of feminism is the inequality of between initially two genders and now multiple inequalities along the gender spectrum that are basically located in the human body and between what is in the legs, between the legs. Basically, you have a vagina, you have a penis. What does that have to do with the ability to fly an aeroplane? You know, Gogi would have seen that logic instantly and she would have laughed at it. So I would have loved to have had that discussion with her, but it didn't happen. Also, I think, at the time when people like Gogi, when Nalini Malani, when Nilima Sheikh, when Rekha Rodvitya, so many of them were painting. And I'm saying this as somebody from the outside. Women of my uh, generation were out in the streets demonstrating, fighting against dowry, fighting against rape, fighting against marriage laws, fighting against sati, fighting for women's right to have abortions, and so on and so forth. Did those two parallel streams meet? I think they didn't in the early days, but I think they seeped into each other in more ways than we thought then. When you look back with hindsight, you can see that now. So I remember discussions in our feminist groups where we would be very critical of women artists thinking that they are in a you know, elite chamber of their own. They don't know what's going on outside. And I, am, I have no doubt they would be equally critical of us because all they would see of us was sadak pe khade ho ke chilla rahein aur, you know, chati peet rahein aur ye sab kuch. But actually to both those things, there was so much more. And I think that those are the kinds of conversations which today are opening up between the practice of art and between the practice of feminism. And of course, feminism in India cannot but be all the things that Gogi was talking about. Every feminist talks about tales of her grandmother, the stories that are handed down to her. Every feminist talks about the struggle between wanting to be a mother and yet fighting against the imposition of that role on her. I don't, I've never wanted that. But anyway, that's beside the point. Uh, but those are real struggles because after all, as women, we are also... Um, bound by the patriarchies in which we have grown up, and we internalize them in many ways. So I think that this whole question that is raised again and again, was Gogi a feminist? And um, I think it's an extraneous question, it doesn't matter if she was. 
How did Gogi see feminism? I think that is the question. And I wish that she hadn't seen it how she saw it. I wish that she had seen in feminism everything that she was doing. Because in her practice, in her thinking, in her life, in her relationships, she was a deeply feminist. And that, what else is feminism if not that? So I don't know if that answers yeah, your question. Do you but see an echo of that in her art practice as well? Absolutely, I see an echo of that in her art practice. You know, I talk in my piece about this painting, which when she told me about it, the story has haunted me since then, you know. Uh, Tilokima, that picture. Mm -hmm. And when she was looking for it, I remember she told Miki, and Miki was giving her the measurements, you know. And I was thinking, yeah, Miki identifies the painting by the measurements, and she identifies it by the subject. That really struck me. But um, in that painting, what is, what is Gogi doing? She is really looking at that deep sense of longing and loss that lives inside, that inhabits that woman's heart. Mm. And Gogi can see it. And she can describe it through her work. When she's listening to stories of women in her, in Ponta Sahib, in her village, and they're coming and telling her all their stories, she can see them. When she's trying, mm. running about the village, trying to find the young woman who is to be married, who can't be found, and when they find her, they can't get the smell of gobar out of her hair. Um, what is she doing? She's actually empathizing from a deep empathy with that woman. Mm. What is that if not feminism? Yeah, her art was, I think, a lot to do with empathy yeah. and with women's issues, but also with, uh, with with other people, other human beings and stuff like that. Her art also, very rarely do you see reflections of anger in her work. Uh, there are very, very rare works where, you know, Kali with a sickle is walking down and that happens when Nirbhaya happens, etc. But otherwise, it's a kind of empathic, empathetic, uh, uh, you know, uh, way of looking at and bringing them on to the same platform, etc. Uh, what I'd like to ask you, Rubina, is <clears throat> you talked about uh, the, uh, you know, in Gadi, where uh, people are telling her, "Don't paint the nude figure," etc. Uh, and of course, she always said that, "I don't paint nude figures; these are unclothed figures." Uh, but we'd had her predecessors, Amrita Shergill, had painted nudes, including herself. Uh, in the nude. We had B. Prabha who was painting uh, nude uh, figures, or at least uh, figures where the torso uh, was not clothed, etc. Uh, when Gogi moves from her canvases to her uh, watercolor gouaches and she brings the unclothed body in, do you think she's resorting to painting, let's say, the Kinneri or uh, the Kamdhenu and these figures, uh, the Hathyoganis, etc., as unclothed figures? and therefore using mythology as a prop to communicate that idea uh, because she senses that resistance otherwise if she doesn't use these props or whatever that there might be a sense of trouble for her i mean she is painting desire uh, she's painting desire her women are fully made up there's lipstick on their uh, faces they're wearing alta on their palms and their feet, etc. The whole idea of fecundity, fertility, desire is very, very strong in her works. About the accessibility of the image was very important. She used to talk about that, you know, that there is an image which is familiar. It's in the psyche of us, okay, of my people or our people. And that mattered a lot to her, that if I use these tropes, if I use those images, Okay, and reinvent them or re-examine them or reinterpret them. Okay, connection. yeah, the connect was very important for her. She felt that her work needed to be, uh, needed to reach more people, needed to reach communities. You know, it should be, she looked for collective responses. She wanted responses from people. She told me sometimes stories about how she would call mm -hmm. uh, young girls or anybody, even the working mates. Hmm. She would call them, all of them home and show her works and ask them, kya dikta hai tumhe, kya lagta hai? You know, those kinds of conversations she used to have quite regularly. Okay, and, and I've been also a witness to such a conversation. And I think she was driving this point all the time that that accessibility came because I tried to take images which I grew up with and many of many others were familiar with. And then I wanted to 
play with them, you know, uh, uh, bring in satire, bring in sarcasm, bring in, you know, statement, comment, whatever through it. Uh, she 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 liked that that mode of working. She she th she felt that confrontation always doesn't work for her. For her, it was interesting to weave the story or take something old and you know make it new in a in a very uh, in a very powerful way. It could bring. Sometimes people said, like she used to say that they would say, oh, your 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 women don't look pretty. Mm -hmm. She said, I never want to make a perfect or pretty yeah. woman. Okay, what I'm trying. Try to think what I'm trying to show, you know, why Alta on the feet or why they are so cramped or, you know, why this hybrid imagery, which is also very discomforting at times. And yeah, yeah. a lot of people cannot take it, you know. Mm -hmm. And yet for her, those were ways of expressing and, uh, and telling something. And if you asked her, she could actually tell you why she did that, okay. But she knew that the image must be as compelling for someone to come and see it and think about it. And she tried this all the time with students, with other artists, with, uh, as I said, with uh, maids, with anybody who. So I think for her that mattered a lot. And I think that's what she was looking at. How do you connect with the past, but don't accept it fully? Okay, it's not that whenever you take look at the past, you have to always be very happy about what many has been hua. You know, you can still be very critical of some things that you may not you know, want to continue with. So how do you work with continuity, but but disrupt it, okay? And bring, make sense of it in a contemporary way. That was something. Yeah, compelling, but not confrontational. And yes, a lot. Yeah. so the two things that you do notice in her work, for example, is uh, uh, her characters, her protagonists, yeah. never look out, they're not engaging mm -hmm. with the viewer. They are self-absorbed. Mm -hmm. So they're seeking desire and, and a sense of escapism, maybe, but they're engaged with themselves uh, somewhere. And I think that's a very, very important facet of her art practice. But there is something that I, that you also notice very strongly about her work when you go around and you see her images, etc. You see how she also negates male presence from her art. Mm -hmm. It is about the woman as a protagonist, and maybe she's self-contained within that. Mm -hmm. Uh, whatever her experiences are, but in negating that male presence, I'm also wondering uh, how we look at it. Is that an aspect of feminism? And I'd like to ask you about that uh, separately, but uh, in negating that male presence, uh, is she, in a sense, uh, becoming a woman painter who's painting woman, women subjects for women uh, viewers? Is she creating a limitation or is she expanding it? But she negates the male figure maybe or male presence, but she has talked about how she wants to discomfort the male gaze. Okay, it's, I think her paintings are not just for women in that sense, you know. A lot of it, a lot of it is for men to realize is what she feels, you know. The whole idea of, as you talk, wish fulfillment, desires, escapism, fantasy being her own self, being in her own space, looking for freedom. The whole kindery concept as she talks about, you know, the idea of flights of both self and imagination. I think have a lot to do with, I don't think it can be seen purely in the absence of the male or the male counterpart or the absence of the male gaze. Okay, uh, would you also like to perhaps uh, respond to that? The absence of the male figure in her art. It's there in the early works where you uh, have a sense and then she removes it entirely. How would you read something like this, Urvashi? How would you read of happiness? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I get a lot of this male bashing on these, on these conversations. <laughs> Actually, to go back to your earlier question yeah, to Rubina, yeah. um, you know, I don't think Gogi's drawing on the mythological or the mythic figure is as instrumentalist as we might think that she brings that in as that might be more acceptable or anything like that. Uh, of course, I can't speak with any depth of knowledge because um, I'm speaking on the basis of those brief conversations. 
But I think for her, what really had a lot of meaning were stories, of course, mm. and uh, the past. And the past is never just the past, it is the present. It is the present. As she used to say that um, all these characters, you know, Yashpal, her father, her grandmother, these all come to meet me every night. She used to say, I open my eyes and talk to them. I talk to them with them. And I tell them what I'm doing. And then they talk about that and we have a conversation. And at some stage when I gave her my book to read and she found it very difficult to read. But then I said to her, read the story about my mama. Then she read it and then she, he was included in her night visitors now. She said, Ab, Rana bhi aata hai, raat ko mere se baat karta hai. So I think that... This is your uncle who went to Pakistan. Yeah, who, didn't, who stayed back in Pakistan and never came oh. to India. So... Um, so she, um, I think that in a sense that is what, uh, you know, explains the choice, if you can call it a choice, mm. of um, the mythic. I don't even think it is, Rubina, as mm. you were saying that she's perhaps doing something which is easily recognized. Well, it may be, but I don't know. Accessible. Recognizable. Accessible, yeah. yeah. That, is, that is entirely possible. I, I, I don't know, but I think, yeah, that could be. But I don't think that it was, you know, thinking that, okay, I will choose this form because this is the form that that might work and people might um, uh, relate to it better. So I don't think it's that. The absence of the male, um, so I don't think that she's painting for women. I don't think that she is wanting to be seen as a woman painter because that would fall into her uh, her rejection, if you like, of feminism and the notion of feminism. And if she wanted to own to being a woman painter, she would have to own up to that and, mm. and also say that her gender influenced everything, which it might well do, but maybe she doesn't want to say it that way. So I don't even think it's that. I don't even think she's painting for women. I think she's definitely painting for everybody who can look at the works and make what they will of it and who will be disturbed and discomforted by uh, everything. But I think, yes, the men are, have been leached out of her work and they stay leached out. And um, to my mind, I think that probably is a very deliberate thing that she does. Mm. And I don't think she does it self-consciously as a feminist, but she does it because they don't seem to be necessary. They don't seem to be necessary to what these women are living, the memories they are drawing on, when they're flying over there, you know, in the sky, heading to their old homes, trying to see their old homes. It's not the male memory or the memories of the men that they are carrying with them or that are the most powerful. It's something else altogether. When she's painting the Lokima, as you say, the inward looking thing, what is she looking at? What is she thinking of that woman? The sense of loss of her life. Mm which is so different and from the life of luxury that she's living, but which in Gogi's eyes and the protagonist's eyes has the real meaning. It's not the life of luxury that she's living. And the men don't count. So if she were to bring men into the work now, I think it would seem like... An yeah, imposition. Yeah, compensatory, deliberate. It's like having a panel discussion where you include one woman and then you think that uh, humne kar diya. so it might feel a bit like that. Yeah. It feels like the, the work feels whole without women, I mean, without men. It well, does. Well, I, I mean, I totally buy into the idea that she is creating a sense of discomfort for the viewer. And, mm -hmm. and I suspect for the male viewer much more, because when you look at a Mundi series, for example, uh, she is putting the woman out there and she is creating that sense of discomfort in the viewer saying these women are being commodified and she's asking why. And she does the same thing actually with her uh, protagonists, her women protagonists throughout her practice, etc. Uh, she's also very subtle in very beautiful uh, ways. I mean, we look at paintings like her homecoming series, etc. And they seem so wonderful, this flight of a creature, winged creature going over a meadow of flowers, etc. All of it looks so beautiful. But these paintings actually end up and uh, conclude with the winged creature, bird woman, actually arriving home, often in Himachal, 
where the bird is located outside the house, looking in but unable to enter the house yeah. for whatever reasons there are. So she is creating that sense that there is patriarchy, mm -hmm. there is a certain sense of hypocrisy, yeah. and she's showing or reflecting that, but she's reflecting it in a way where when you immediately see the painting, you may not understand it, so you need to perhaps get to know the artist a little more, about the artist a little more, and then when you grapple with it, it's very, very deep uh, somewhere. Uh, and therefore, I ask uh, the question, and I will open this to audiences now. I know that uh, time is going on, but uh, yeah. This is true, yeah. when I said this. I've had such long conversations, and she's so deep about, uh, she's reading, uh, history, she's reading literature, mm -hmm. she's reading mythologies, mm -hmm. and it may, it may not translate maybe into the image, but Mahasnan she has criticized, mm -hmm. okay, <laughs> the whole idea, notion of purity mm -hmm. given by men. She will tell you 101 stories around Mahasnan, mm -hmm. Mahasnan visited, what women are treated like. She would tell you why I'm saying it's deeper than what we it think in Sati. terms of, oh yeah, yeah, Sati, yeah. Ki puri story, she can tell you a hundred anecdotes on it, okay? Mm -hmm. So whatever, whether it is Kinari or Kam they do, I'm not just saying it's such a surface scratching of taking mythic mm -hmm. uh, yeah. images or uh, just reading surface mythological stories which can now be traced in Google also. No, for her the path was, the process was too long to do that, you know, mm -hmm. and what came out of it may may bring it out, may not bring it out, but Gogi, the person, if you sat down with her, if you listened to her, she was deeply embedded in these stories, yeah. anecdotes, what was happening with yeah. women, mm -hmm. and critical of it, critical of notions of beauty imposed by mm -hmm. men. Mm -hmm. no, she said, I paint all colors. My women are black, my men are brown, my women mm -hmm. are white. India does not have one stereotypical yeah. woman yeah. image. And she would say it very, uh, very strongly. She yeah, would say yeah, these yeah, things, yeah. you know. And therefore, you will find my women sometimes dark, my women sometimes brown, my women sometimes. And every little thing that I learned from her or heard her say made sense to me because it was not something that came through just one meeting or just was a uh, conversation just so simple about. Uh, a cow, which is a wish-fulfilling cow. No, there are layers in it, and there are stories and stories that she could talk about before she made the image, okay? So she would have those stories, and she was very well grounded in this. She was critical so much of many things that have come down to her, handed over, okay? And when she narrated stories of her life, she, she of course, talked about her grandmother a lot because she, she was, uh, she was uh, an image, a role model. But she talked a lot about her father mm. and her father, who she says was really the person who gave her a very, uh, what to say, a, uh, gave her freedom in her childhood. She said in that spacious Haveli or home where she lived in the hills, there used to be a ridge or a bridge, like a very narrow bridge that connected two parts yeah, of this so home. Stone bridge, yeah. And she would run mm -hmm. across. She was so naughty and people mm -hmm. you will have to look for her because she's always up on a tree sometimes hiding somewhere mm -hmm. running across and her mother might feel that oh this is a girl who's you know this girl boy thing you know mm -hmm. but the father would just encourage never discourage her to do any of these things make her run let her fall all those things she talks talked about she said I grew up with my aunts who used to cross the jungle at odd hours they would work, women were so hard working, they would work in the fields. That's why the sickle for her was an agricultural symbol and the hammer was an industrial symbol, she would say, the sickle. And she would talk about the sickle often, how three of her aunts or relatives at night, when they crossed the jungle, they, I mean, they used to, she used to talk very beautifully about, they used to wear a belt around their waist which would have only two things. One would be a mirror for vanity, because she'd be long hours away from home, and another was a sickle. And she said three or four of them actually killed a tiger, a uh, leopard, a predator right there in the tall grass hiding, and they were coming home, and they were, being, they were about to be attacked, and here were these women, you know. And uh, she told these stories about their... Uh, 
their hard life and you know also how excited she would be about listening to many of these stories that would give her such strength and the whole notion of empowering oneself and empowering women and empowering oneself and there were many such stories that she narrated about a life the hatha yogini for instance is a very interesting example where she always used to say why it's always hatha yog yeah. because only men can have austere severe practices and women are not capable of or their bodies are not capable of and she painted a whole series called hatha yogini you know with the hatha yogini is the woman who really you know is sitting on a tiger and you know riding it and many of those uh, works that you see there is a yeah so i uh, yeah can i just add one little thing you know when rubina was talking i was thinking of that that this story i keep going back to that tiloki mahavali story on the face of it the story is about a woman a village woman who gets um, to live the life of luxury by marrying or being married to this wealthy man and her son also gets a home so it's a story of um, achievement of certain kind of happiness but that's not what gogi chooses to paint about that story mm. what she chooses to paint is the unfulfilled yearning the the longing for the home the migration that has happened you know voluntarily or otherwise and that to me is the really feminist thing mm. you know reaching much beyond the surface story yeah. so i mean what you talked about it uh, the idea of mythology etc i uh, i mean to the extent that she was borrowing from mythology we know mm. she was uh, taking these images out of mythology, mythology etc whether she prescribed to the story within that uh, mythological episode is something i would find difficult to understand the iconography she certainly used uh, and i think uh, in various ways she extended that uh, narrative uh, to create these uh, images that we are kind of uh, now so familiar with uh, somewhere the whole idea of uh, you know uh, women's concerns etc coming through and the lack of choices that she talked about for women so whether it's uh, all these flowers are for you the full carry uh, you know uh, women's sorority etc but in uh, when she talks about swayamvar for example uh, she looks at the hypocrisy of even that where she says that you're supposed to have a choice but how do you have a choice because you've never met these individuals from whom you're supposed to pick one garland and say okay this is my husband on what basis do you do it so so she's questioning that mythology even while she's picking up her uh, image making or imagery from uh, within that and i think that is what uh, that constant questioning uh, was such a strong part of what she was uh, narrating visually uh, through her art practice uh, and also in borders and you know when she did these works yeah, yeah. she used to talk about these are views from the hills mm -hmm. and sometimes when you're up in the hills uh, pakistan and india don't exist it exists as one land you know and this is like crossing over these uh, borders and imagining you know a land which is not really uh, where humans don't draw these uh, you know borders and demarcations and things like that so a uh, uh, lot of these uh, paintings which she did where the woman is flying over these uh, bed of uh, land of full of uh, foliages and flowers was uh, was a very uh, was a site that she was very familiar with and she talked mm. about it at length also yeah yeah yeah, yeah about yeah. it